Learning to be human, abridged by Leston Havens, read by Vincent Bagnall. Friendship. Friendship in a sense other than acquaintanceship unites two qualities dangerous when found together, closeness and openness. I want my friend to be near. I also open my time and space to his or her scrutiny and comment. Friendship can therefore be a hunting license for the predatory. True friendship, in the sense of a relationship protective of both parties, must as a result be rare. True friends need that unusual combination of both parties wanting to be close and at the same time tactful of their exposure. He or she is in a confined space, the tissues of which have in many and surprising places been worn raw. Thus friendship is as remarkable for what is not said as it is for any exchange of confidences. My friends noticing what I am not ready to share must be concealed behind a graceful not noticing. Otherwise I will feel him watching me from behind his warmth. In the novel Shibumi, Trevanian has the protagonist receive as a gift an important secret from a dying man, who gives it because the protagonist never once mentioned that the man was a midget, even so much as to comment that it didn't matter. My impression is that men's friendships tend to err on the side of too much silence and protection and women's in the opposite way. I have known women whose friends feed off them, like Barracuda, and men with no friends, or friends so little known, their suicide was a surprise. If a particular time was painful, it must be approached gingerly, if at all. That time or place or presence still aches, only in the springtime of friendship, in what is called chumship, are the two young parties likely to be so virgin of defeat as to move easily in each other's experience. At that time, characters as well may be little formed and open to imitation and identification. Both can feel like twins. So when people are young, as in school or college, friendships are made the way almost nothing else between humans is made. Friendships with a strength that endures growing incompatibilities of temperament and situation. Both friends may even come to feel, how could we ever have been friends? The answer is because the two can return to the time and space they were in together. Such is the joyful side of reunions when worlds long gone are for a while re-experienced. Just as friendship can be based on the past, it can be based on the future. We share a common cause. Then differences are forgotten in the intense shared futuring. These friendships are more fragile than those based on the past because the future may not be realized together or never come into a settled existence. For the most part, the chance of such easy friendship fades then friends know sensitivities that can only be put aside or approached cautiously. This is the reason your best friend won't tell you, often something you need to know. The good friend values the friendship more than the state of your dentures or the fate of your marriage, if commenting on either would threaten the friendship. At this point, friendship enters the narrower space of walking together or meeting over lunch. It needs this limitation to prevent what a broader exposure of time and space must thrust into view, an exposure that even the most seasoned tact cannot master. It needs this limitation to preserve its emotional base in mutual admiration. It is mutual admiration that fuels the closeness and animates the tact. I wish to keep this person the person I love. Amidst all its talk, friendship is a conspiracy of silence. 
For this and other reasons, friendship between couples is rarer still. As we all talk, what I hear you say to someone else shakes our relationship. It is like listening in on someone's phone and the statistical likelihood that all four in their various combinations should wish closeness and protect openness approaches the astronomical. Friendship is seen as a model for psychotherapy, for relationships with oneself or others. For example, the so-called I-thou. All in sexuality, society, and marriage. Psychotherapy has been called paid friendship. The reasons for calling it that are instructive as well as corrective of the snide implication. Psychotherapy, like friendship, embraces both closeness and at least a one-sided openness. Because psychotherapy, unlike friendship, is not equal time. The payment compensates the psychotherapist, in part, for not being listened to and understood. Further, because friendship is rare and highly valued, people are happy to pay for it. More pointedly still, because many friendships are paid for in ways much more costly than psychotherapy, such as when openness is abused. The cost of psychotherapy comes into a new light. Sadly, though, openness in psychotherapy, too, often stands abused. So, some of the differences vanish. People speak of being their own best friend. Meanwhile, we all talk to ourselves. This last fact illustrates why friendship is not easy or even wise in relation to oneself. Certainly, people berate themselves, inspire and give advice to themselves. The difficulty of being a friend to oneself, except in the sense of soothing or encouraging oneself, is that one knows too much, and in remembering and thinking, treats oneself tactlessly. In fact, one needs to treat oneself thus to dispel sentimental illusions. The closest people get to inner friendship is in neurosis, when a selective amnesia or denial maintains a friendly interior. The price for this is heavy and often entails being unready and off guard, a certain level of anxiety and regret. As inner ingredients, both maintains realistic attitudes and as a dividend gives friendship with others its special joy. St. Teresa found a serene dissatisfaction with herself. I wish my dissatisfaction were serene. Here is a saving observation. Pompous people often talk to themselves as pompously as they do to others, so that any suffering we experience is shared with them. Many attempt to make friendship a general model for relationships with others. I never met a man I didn't like. As a political posture, this sentiment is useful, but if taken with full seriousness, it either degrades friendship to a vigilant acquaintanceship or exposes its defenders to abuse. It is possible for friendship to serve as a model for ideal relationships, as in the concept of I-thou. This goal of treating others as subjects and not objects is identical with what I have described as true friendship. The other's lived time and space is allowed access to one's experience on its own terms. However, the elevation of ideal relationships to a general social formula tempts people to treat the invasive with excessive respect. One should keep the ideal for the ideal. Romance combines elements of sexuality and friendship as its most intense, this is called being in love. Psychological closeness and openness then merge with physical attraction and responsiveness to a sometimes explosive result. Only in religious awe and political mass movements is this level of excitement approached. These are all examples of human fusion. The transient quality of romance is related not only to this intensity, but to the perils of closeness and openness, especially when experienced bodily. 
the difficulties of maintaining oneself under condition of merger are multiplied by the temptations to bodily conquest and surrender. What is a physiologically determined transient experience of sexuality has attached to it the psychologically shaped hopes of continuance, even permanence. This hope may still be more ambitiously pursued into marriage, while friendships can call on silence, tact, and their spatial equivalents of separation and absence. Romance attempts to maintain itself in the incandescence of mental and bodily fusion. This is usually done by the surrender of one party to the other. The assumption of a slave role, or a virtual going out of one's own existence. Friendship may heighten sexuality and romance. It still more often diminishes it by familiarity and embarrassment. Much of the appeal of prostitutes is their anonymity. This one hardly has a name, at least not a last name. Few are known the way friends are known. The whole transaction is enacted by that largely uniform space we inhabit, the body. It may be for this reason that prostitutes, it is said, seldom kiss, in contrast to courtesans. Kissing is the smallest bodily remove from conversation. Wilde remarked that nothing so destroys romance as a sense of humor in the partner. The point is that friendship invites a tactful, sometimes humorous, exposure. This is not easily made part of a passionate bodyhood. Friendship as an ideal is not only carried into sexuality and marriage, but into ideals of society as a whole. In the movement from solitude to society, the step beyond friendship is the club. This is a union of the like-minded, whether the point of similarity is as small as the desire to eat or play golf together, or as large as shared values and political ideals. These last become little societies or tribes, and may even grow into nations. The idea of communism, that is the elimination of barriers of class and property, is the concept of friendship carried to its logical extreme. We are to be close to one another in these respects and not greater or smaller. It is not surprising that the imposition of such ideals on a diverse human nature requires authoritarian power and force. It is an enforced friendship, like the pattern of domination and submission by which closeness is often continued in romance and marriage. Friendship cannot be the ideal form of marriage either. Marriage is a dangerous sea crossing, often with many passengers aboard and sometimes divided crew. Tact is important, but not always desirable. If your best friend won't tell you, your spouse must be able to. In this respect, marriage is more like one's relationship with oneself than like friendship. Tact must sometimes give way to a saving ruthlessness. Sexuality. Life begins in sexuality, and for many it resumes there too, even the very old. This is because sexuality is the body as both subject and object of desire, feeling and felt. Sensation is fully mobilized by this concentration. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, even the sensations of balance and movement are both here and there. The mobilization is affected by putting all space and time in the service of the body. Presence is transformed seductively. For example, clothing becomes a code of disclosures and concealments of the sexual body that lies underneath. The world itself is centered on giving resonance to the experience anticipated 
boyhood is doubled, bodyhood is doubled, heterosexuality and homosexuality lose their distinctiveness, and both can be played out where a man and woman are present. The man is mirrored back to the man in the eyes of the woman, and the woman to the woman. Temporally, sexuality mobilizes expectation in foreplay, discovers in climax what may have been the first occasion for breaking the now from past and future, and finds a chastened pasting in detumescence. Time also plays a decisive role in sexual meeting. This is because sexuality, being an experience of bodyhood, rests on the rhythms of physiological arousal. One's lived moment must be matched with another's. For this reason, the experiences of waiting and hurrying acquire their sexual status as emblems of love. So large are the differences between the usual pace of male and female arousal that in the temporal sphere, homosexuality gains an advantage that it has lost to heterosexuality in the spatial doubling of bodyhood. Waiting on feelings is the lot of both sexuality and love because feelings are what they are and cannot be pushed by any legislation, however urgent. Mobilizing sensations can create an embodiment of me or you. I am yours. This leads to many of the phenomena of jealousy. Is your body still mine? If it has been another's, are you still mine? Poor humans caught in sensations that seem for a moment the whole world have read meaning out of them and then back in again. Power and possession, weakness and surrender enter sexual meeting both as imaginative themes for arousal and as actual events that may inhibit arousal. Sexuality thus represents an exquisite balancing act between the demands of imagination and reality. Only the most self-possessed, only those able to be both free and compliant, can afford full conquest or surrender without actual diminution. The danger for the less fortunate is that what can be imaginative play comes to represent actual domination and actual submission. Similarly, in my seduction of you, I look for signs that you as much as your body, are aroused. Men and women learn to play on the other's body, hoping that this instrument, the body, can command the soul. Scruton wrote, The bodily unity that lies within my grasp is identified in my thinking with another unity, that of the perspective which peers from its face. It is into the well of this perspective that all my desirous gestures are thrown, and I survey its bodily surface for signs of my own significance. Eyes become literally windows of the soul, little able or willing to hide their message of real or incomplete surrender. Thus slave owners searched the faces of their chattels for looks of full obedience. Here body and soul diverge from one another so that my capacity to reduce your body to chattel to means in my eyes your value as a person, or my capacity to use my body to enslave yours, undermines my self-possession through guilt, reducing me. Did the soul emerge as an idea when the body, seemingly conquered through physical power or lust, nevertheless rebelled? Perhaps the only remaining signs of life being those soulful, rebellious eyes? The soul appears in sexuality as something to be trampled on or destroyed, as in rape, or cooperatively in shared moments of delight, or in the experience of melding body and soul, as in romance. Freud was wise to make sexuality the center of his psychology because of the innumerable ways in which this bodily experience both shapes and is shaped by the psychological. Another example, wishing can itself become the object of wishing. I may not desire you as much as I wish you to desire me. 
Such is the essence of the psychological, the ability to take oneself or others or any aspect of ourselves and others as an object. The result is that I hardly see myself or you, only the ideas and images I have formed. My perspective. Magritte put under his picture of a pipe. This is not a pipe. But Cezanne did not want to paint pictures. He is rumored to have said he wanted to be like nature and make apples. Why not? Since he was part of nature. Sexuality can be aroused by mere images, yet it is like nature, able to germinate the real. Is this a trick of nature to propagate the species? If so, it's a cruel trick. I may propagate the species with someone I hardly know, someone I cannot recognize in the morning. But crueler still, parents may be excited by their children, perhaps by images from their own childhood. What sexuality first germinated, sexuality may now use. As a final cruelty, this may be the closest both get to a moment of love. The great engine of life turns on a tiny point that is my point of sight, my perspective. I must train that little light to guide me. I do not want to be trampled on or destroy. I want to share myself with you. And nothing illustrates better the promising, subtle, and perilous links between body and soul than the varied history of romance. What may seem a passionate shared bodyhood in the romantic friendships of youth proves often the search for a self, especially in friendships of the same sex. The worship of one ideal partner by another reveals the loved body as chiefly the casing or signature of what the loving partner would be. The closeness, so seemingly physical, is really an effort at psychological identification. One party means to come away transformed by the other. Then liking is an effort to be like. Insofar as this effort at transformation is successful, the person begins to love himself or herself. The self takes itself as an object of respect or even adoration rather than hesitation or loathing. Sexuality serves the same end when one sees oneself mirrored in the aroused astonishment of another. The two processes work best when they work together. Then one is loved by someone one wishes to be like. The self wishing to be transformed is seen by the ideal of transformation as already lovable. The danger of becoming like another when one is really not like that other is lessened. Individuals can be loved and respect themselves for what they themselves are or can be. The wonders of idealization and sexuality never cease. The Russians, seeking to shame and blackmail the visiting Indonesian leader Sukarno, gave him Moscow prostitutes and filmed the proceedings. On being shown the films, Sukarno asked for copies so that they could be shown back home. The Indonesian leader knew his power stemmed in part from being a fertility god whose strength sowed the fields. Men are said to enter relationships most often through sexuality, and women through affection. Romance is the opportunity to distribute these interests more equally between the two. It continues even after fusion has passed, if both parties find the give and take welcome. Then people learn from one another. It is an exchange of gifts. Couples report that the body can be a loyal friend to such engaged minds. Some women become more sexually adventurous. Some men even learn to talk. But sexuality in long relationships may seem the pursuit of the impossible. A few play out the old ideal of being all man and all woman. The ones I know say their minds wander. There is also the exchange of fantasies and images. For some, this is a godsend. Others find it intrusive on love of one another. I think the luckiest are excited by the body itself. Body communes with body while the minds rest. Or those moving past unfamiliarity, even beyond strangeness and the disfigured, place themselves so firmly, patiently, winningly in the experience of the other that the unfamiliar seems transformed. Do they deceive themselves? Or was Nietzsche right? 
he called that emerging beauty of the greatly loved. It's thanks for our hospitality. I know a woman with a withered arm who was so well loved she came to love that once hated arm and she herself became more beautiful. Many more are disillusioned with romance than bodyhood as both desiring and the object of desire presents a meeting ground that is most simply experienced in masturbation. I give my body pleasure, but this apparently closed circle of bodyhood is still open to self, imagination, and the world. People do not masturbate themselves in any meaningful sense any more than they can tickle themselves. The body is the object of desire, yet the necessary intermediary is an imaginative creation or an object endowed with imaginative force as our fetishistic objects. One does not so much play with oneself as with an image or an object. Perhaps people would be able to make themselves laugh by tickling as they make themselves climax by masturbation. If an image of someone else tickling them could be sufficiently aroused. Nevertheless, masturbation is a refuge from the world and the vicissitudes of time. Sartre wrote, an onanist by choice, Genet prefers his own caresses because the enjoyment received coincides with the enjoyment given. The passive moment coincides with the moment of greatest activity. He is at the same time this consciousness which coagulates and this hand which becomes agitated and churns. Those to whom the world and time have given largely pain and humiliation must find this place and moment of satisfaction if they are to survive at all. And the good-hearted may prefer to use themselves rather than to use others. Thus, masturbation is a comment on experience at large. The tradition that condemns it is invited to look at the world and times from which it is a refuge. The dignity of masturbation lies in this statement of the dispossessed and all those who know the world. How long will it take audiences to tire of watching failed romance between people of foolish illusions and impossible personalities? So far is self-possession from being an ideal, even where, as in romance, it is most needed. Instead, there is such an ideal as simultaneous orgasm. Humans hoping to master time and physiology in an act of charity or conquest or wonderful fusion. Yet whether as self-possession or the perfect orgasm or enduring romance, this search for ideals remains a central part of the human effort to secure our time and space. Marriage. Marriage is the possibility of human existence, in which lived time and space are most extensively shared. Moreover, it declares itself to the world at large and proposes a perhaps indefinite continuance. It is therefore ideally placed to illustrate the extraordinary difficulties in the way of existence and the various solutions proposed. In much of the Western world today, these difficulties are no longer ones of physical survival and of passing on the germ plasm, but instead of psychological survival. In keeping with its psychological task, marriage has become what is called self-conscious, less conventional and more reflective. It has begun later and ended earlier, more thought about and more often dissolved. Many times, marriage starts with a sense of safety and relief, the loneliness of being single, the hazards of seduction or courtship, the narrow social presence of bachelor or spinsterhood, the question of one's acceptability and lovableness. All these diminish with marriage, even vanish, until the difficulties of being together in more than metered space and time reveal themselves. These give birth to a sad human cry. Why must life be so complex? 
Why can't we just exist happily and let each other be? Why are even fortunate physical and financial circumstances not enough for life? Many have blamed neuroticism. Others, human predation and submission. Still others, the larger social scene. But it is also possible to point out features of such a widely shared experience that are intrinsically difficult and require ingenuity and persistence for even partial solutions. The idea of building psychologically is evident in work, art, and science. Marriage is the smallest social unit for building, and like the state, subject to disagreement, rebellion, and civil war. We know that homes can be built together in both the physical and psychological senses. What does it mean to build a relationship, or, as is often hoped, to make a life together? Building a relationship or making a life together is to fill shared space and time. This is evident in the accumulated contents of a home, or in the meeting of bodies sexually, and in the day-to-day, and in the night-to-night. One wakes in the darkness to find a familiar body there, or in the closeness of related presences, children, relatives, neighbors. These are aspects of spatial building. One aspect of building a relationship in marriage is the opportunities that shared time and space provide for accumulation. Old couples discover this crowded spatiality when they have to move. It is literally impossible to move. The home has become like the land, geologically impacted, layered, folded. Shafts can be cut, levels exposed, but this much experience does not move. Another example, people who marry late in life or remarry learn that their time and space cannot be simply handed to another like a ring. Experience has been built and must be rebuilt. In contrast, it is easier to start out together, that is, leave home, begin work, make a dwelling with all their crises and resolutions. Building accumulates possessions. It also accumulates talk. Conversation is the verbal form of building together. And as a rule, people who stop building stop talking. Building in time is to secure shared memories, a full present and a future of varied possibilities. But as soon as this is said, a problem appears that has defied every philosophical and practical attack. How are we to know the time is shared? One fine morning, a spouse awakes to find the other gone. He or she had thought they were together. Such is the very essence of lived time and space. I can be both here, in the sense of clocked and metered time and space, and not here. Hence nervousness in marriage, and a great deal of destructive fussing. Someone has said that you never know another's marriage, only your own, and only half of that. Paradoxically, this is also the central engine of marital success, because I can never know marriage is inherently unstable and mysterious. And this instability and mystery keeps marriage alive. If I knew that you could never escape me, which sometimes you must do, the possibility of stagnation would loom even larger than it does. The best marriages often seem those in which each party has many times wondered why it should continue one more day. The two minds are free to escape the outermost limits of the relationship and as a result see it and perhaps decide to make it better. Minds tightly held in loyalty or servitude must lose perspective, strain, and sometimes break. What is built in time, this relationship that makes part of a life, is precisely the history of experienced crises and resolutions. The sexual act is a bodily metaphor for the experience of possible closeness and climax or distance and disappointment. These are the ways shared time is built. People who share past time recall what they doubted and undertook. Oddly, failures bring couples closest because they have signaled what the relationship could bear. 
and failure, more often than success, deflates vanity with all its capacity to separate. Failure is also the occasion of humor. Humor, as opposed to wit, indicates the safety one party feels in appearing foolish or awkward in the presence of the other. Consideration of the personal qualities critical for marriage has entertained authors and readers, playwrights and audiences for centuries. From long before the taming of the shrew, the vicissitudes of marriage have been explored and imagined into a still unfolding future that includes Anna Karenina and Arms and the Man. The record of classical literature supports the record of everyday life. Great marriages are no more common than great books or paintings. The rest of us can be forgiven. The often wild sea-crossing of marriage suggests criteria for crew membership. The fate of those who see marriage as friendship I have sketched already. The fate of those whose expectations are moonlit nights and glamorous seascapes is no different. The fate of those whose expectations are moonlit nights and glamorous seascapes is no different. But even those who love a gale and ascend the mizzenmast and a rolling sea may find themselves tossed overboard. Nor is a personal preference or a special itch a more reliable guide. Many are recipes for disaster. My experience is that women are generally better judges than men. The point is the qualities necessary in either or both parties are not subject to general laws or prediction. These are what physicists call quantum events not able to be individually calculated. The most extraordinary disabilities often prove serviceable, and peerless ingenuity, courage, and resilience can become an insufferable bore. One reason individual traits do not determine success is that in marriage, perhaps more than in any other relationship, people condition one another. For example, the acquiescent person, married to someone aggressive, reinforces the aggressiveness. In this way, people only a little dominant can gradually become domestic Hitlers. The ready pasting of present also transforms spouses. Any present marriage calls up old family responses. One finds oneself repeating relationships to parents, siblings, even to old images of oneself. This transformation of the present gains almost inexorable force from the similarity of lived spaces. My new family is another family, at least a little like the one I had. The gay relationships I have known seem no different. Power or respect old responses or new, stagnation or vitality, enter with the same force. Successful building is therefore an act of will against the conditionings of past and present. It means to construct something of our own, whether a construction in space, like a home, or an experience, like an adventure that gains its principal reality in time. In either case, this new act has some of the force of the astonishing, most plainly when a home is built to astound the neighborhood, and more personally, when the adventure involves surprise and the spectacular, as is common when people watch sports, read poetry together, go to the theater, or travel. The search for astonishment dominates human life in innumerable ways. This is evident in the newspapers, entertainment, sports, politics, drama, art, even that most deliberative activities, science. The hold of magic on the human mind has the same source. Religion and astonishment are deeply intermixed, whether in the personal experience of the numinous or in the gigantic buildings and statues that world religions have scattered everywhere. The importance of astonishment in ordinary life springs from the need to be moved one is not to be stagnant, depressed, which is the mood of unchanging time. To this end, travel was prescribed for the depressed, or activity of any sort. Something is added to experience that leaves us in a different place. Because of the forces of stagnation, the astonishing is needed the way great physical forces are needed 
in order to move earth and rocks. One basis for astonishment in marriage is the relationship itself. Being in love is its earliest form, then the most commonplace features and events astonish. Then the most commonplace and features and events astonish. The grossest overestimation of the other, toward which the term idealization reaches, transforms the presence and body of the beloved, including whatever objects in space are close by. This overestimation is accompanied by a depletion or humbling of the loving one, like a courtier before a king. The term moving does not do justice to the profound transformation of energies and values involved. Time is transformed as much. Anticipation of the beloved becomes an exquisite amalgam of agony and joy. The mood of meeting remains a predictable altar for the poetic imaginations of every age, and the past remembering of an old love is a torch point to which the most depleted spirits return with a kind of luminescence. Wise people exploit the power of movement of being in love to take them to a new place, as in marriage, to new dwellings and relationships. There are not many such forces. Being in love passes, as a rule, in weeks or months. Then the couple either stagnates or seeks one of the forms of friendship that secure astonishment over longer periods. I believe the commonest of these has been adoration. One of the two parties is elevated to a godlike status. For example, the man as monarch, the woman flatterer, court, and servant. This gains force from the prevailing sexual inequality in our culture. Or the man is all man, and the woman is all woman in a rite of sexual worship. Such an elevation is really an institutionalization, like monarchy or marriage itself, of sentiments that may have occurred before. Yet genuine adoration can seldom survive familiarity, at least when the adorer is valued chiefly for adoring. Institutionalized adoration is therefore self-defeating, unless the two parties are willing to undertake lifelong acting assignments out of tradition or calculation. Another solution partakes of being in love, institutionalized adoration, and respect. This is the idea of putting each other first. Putting the other first is a durable remainder of the once intoxicating love, and it substitutes for mutual adoration the livable ideal of mutual priority. It also draws an element of astonishment from the implied combination of idealization and respect. The capacity for idealization that every hopeful person carries can be transmitted to the other and, by the mutuality of that effort, made available to the relationship at large. Respect tempers both the distortion and control that idealization can produce by asserting, I also take you as you are. This joint conveyance of idealization and respect of devotion to the other's future as well as present, is an astonishing experience. Hegel wrote that no man is a hero to his valet because the valet is a valet. The capacity to idealize is what elevates people above valets. The result is one gives to another and when mutually administered, receives back possibilities for the future that by dint of belief and striving can have surprising results. And when these results are not immediately obvious, in fact to other eyes improbable, they are performative simply by being hoped for. Marriage begins with a performative, I pronounce you man and wife, which creates a fact by being spoken, like the umpire's in or out, or the name I was given that tells me who I am. Marriage can continue with another performative, I believe in you. It is as if the parties are renamed in the light of each other's convictions. However long that takes to complete itself and however incompletely the result is affected. Being in love mobilizes and focuses attention. Time and often marriage 
dissipate it. Even deep, vital people can become serviceable sticks of furniture. As a result, the first mission of a mutual priority is the ordering of attention. In our space, I give you my time. And unlike the student or the reader, the committed mind wanders at its peril. It had better return something to the relationship. That something may only be the fact of attention itself, which under many circumstances is astonishing. Attention is the first step toward what Conrad called the intimate felicities of daily affection, which is as vital to psychological being as oxygen is to the body. It may also be as invisible as oxygen to any but the most careful observers, only making itself known in its absence. Yet after all this talk of attention and astonishment, the most important test of marriage may be this. How many times did each party go to sleep without saying that awful thing each wanted to say? Because marriage is a state without a constitution, even the most determined attention or wisest counsel cannot be effective if the power held in marriage is not checked by something like a constitutional rule. Marriage, as much as the successful nation, needs a means of balancing power. If the extraordinary demands on a continuing relationship are not to end in tyranny and enslavement, a mutual priority balances power, with the result that each must manage both himself or herself, and the other. Congress and the presidency are stalemated. The only recourse is negotiation and eventually compromise. It is the very finality of both authorities that gives good sense a chance to prevail. Once wives were often managed, but not respected. And husbands respected, but not managed. Today, the economic power of men tends to be pitted against the emotional power of women. Nevertheless, management enters marriage as a frequently alien ideal because good spirits hope to prevail by goodness and authoritarian spirits hope to prevail by their power. There are many whom believe that love conquers all. May some good Lord protect each one. Negotiation and management are natural responses to stalemate, but not the only ones. However superior stalemate is to checkmate, it suggests stale mates. A radical loss of movement. Happily, people who share each other's space and time cannot remain still long. Explosions are the natural result of being stuck so close, while neither surrendered nor moved. The vehicle of deliverance is free speech, the constitutional prerogative of mutual authority. Speech is even freer in marriage than it is in the state. For example, permission is granted to shout fire in a burning home. One theme of marital quarrels is often misunderstood. Desperate spouses fall back on an old source of power. The invocation of a third party, an old lover or a parent, as agent of jealousy or support. This pattern was learned in dealing with mother and father. It is not pathological when really needed. The issue frequently is, do you care enough to fight Quarrels between equal parties end either in departure or what is called reflection. In view of the other's authority, one must leave or double back on oneself. That is, take in some hitherto unacknowledged aspect of the other's time and space as it has experienced yours. Typically, this results in feeling bad as the painful aspect of the other's experience is shared. Apology can result but more important, the enlargement of shared experience, which is called understanding. Then the other has the chance to accept the apology, perhaps perfunctorily, but ideally, with an enlargement of that person's understanding, too. Mistakes are to be seen as natural. One seldom learns without making them. A deeper principle of family life may, however, be the principle Aristotle put at the heart of the state. Logic and reason, he suggested, are powerless when quarrels reach the highest levels of politics. The only recourse is confusion, 
with its opportunities for time and chance to intervene. In the absence of such saving confusion, the family may have to go to bed. Marriage has been called a great cage, with everyone on the outside trying to get in, and everyone on the inside trying to get out. This is not the whole story, but it is true enough to pay off the psychotherapist's mortgage. Divorce. Just as many get in, many get out. Then the metaphor of the cage referred to in the last chapter collapses, because divorce means the rending of the largest space and time humans share. As a result, there are few easy divorces. There is only the possibility of learning and renewal. Not many can be so buoyant as Margaret Mead, who announced that she had had three happy marriages. Anthropologists of Margaret Mead would like to hear from the husbands. Space says it first, in an emptied house. What has been occupied, however, unhappily, is now still. Then humans discover they can be as much alive to one another in footsteps and rustlings, the closing of a cabinet door, as in many of the passionate happenings of life. And the home may be emptied in another way. The one left may send his or her imagination where the other has gone. So there really is no one home. One less egg to boil, one less plate to clean, the saying goes, but on a dying note. The one leaving steps into a world both alive with possibility and curiously forlorn. This is because the leave-taking is for a long time only a movement in metered and dated space and time. The boldest and least regretful imaginations still turn back, not only or chiefly in guilt, but because the past grips. Changed circumstances are reminders by their very differences, even very happy differences. Time reveals a feature of experience perhaps encountered on no other occasion. For the one who goes, time is accelerated. For the one who stays, it is slowed or stopped. The act of separation has pushed one into the future and the other into the past. The rending of shared time and space has separated their lived times as much as their spaces. Many also discover that what they wanted least is what they need most. This may be hard to admit, especially if vindictiveness prevails. Women are said to do better alone than men, perhaps because they are less really alone in our competitive culture, and they are the ones most often left. But divorced women have thrust upon them what this culture neglects for women, the need for independence and authority. Divorce is difficult in the same way marriage is difficult. It opens out onto fresh ground as long as divorce is trivialized in the same way marriage is trivialized by seeing it as two people joining or parting. It must be not only difficult but impossible. As marriage means building a new time and space, so does divorce if it is not to mean regret and death. Again, like marriage, divorce secures its covenants from the limits it puts on the future. At present, these concern chiefly income, property, and custody, as usual, what can be counted, like money and days. These possessions and division of possessions in quantifiable space and time repeat the first steps of marriage in which people share property and paychecks. The transformation of lived space and time may or may not follow or proceed. My mother remained married to my father for long after they were divorced. Indeed, it was easier to be married to him when he wasn't around. She went on building the home they started together as if he were gone for a weekend. 
This is to say the divorce may be the continuance of marriage under changed conditions, sometimes but not always the reverse of the way war is the continuance of politics. I believe it is important to acknowledge this possibility lest people expect too much new of divorce, as they may have expected too much new of marriage. Humans are capable of continuing what they were doing under the most extraordinarily different circumstances in apparent obliviousness of night or arctic air. Divorce is susceptible to these silent continuances because it is so little presided over by ceremony and celebration. The realization of marriage begins for many only at the altar, and that fails to penetrate the lived experiences of not a few. The present begun in marriage can continue indefinitely despite divorce until some milestone pasts the futureless, perhaps the death, of the departed spouse. The tragedy of divorce is not so much the end of marriage, which may never have begun, but this ease of endlessness. When divorce was shameful and unmentionable, the ease was greatest. Nowadays, psychotherapists, group meetings, every magazine and newspaper cry up divorce, so there's less chance of it slipping by unnoticed. Soon we will institutionalize divorce. The churches and city halls of the future will discover solemn rites separating past and future, protecting children, commemorating ends as well as beginnings, above all sanctifying what is serious. A human society cannot afford to live in public shame. I doubt this will undermine marriage where it is not undermined already. Nietzsche wrote, it was only by the thought of suicide that I got through many a dark night. The thought of divorce, like the thought of suicide, can lighten the present, lend independence to the spirit, and thrusting aside imprisonment, freshen the urge to try again. The rights of marriage do not make marriage easier, but more formidable. They make it harder to slip into marriage. The same could be true of divorce. Here is a possible ceremony of divorce. Do you take this spouse as your former spouse, for better or for worse, to be met at every graduation, marriage, and funeral, to be like you, capable of error and deceit, deeper understanding than you recognize, wiser judgment than present opinions would allow, to honor what is honorable, remember what was good, forgive what was not, and support one another whenever possible in the remaining races to be run. Such will seem as far-fetched to many present couples as their wedding vows would have seemed to the caveman dragging off his mate. death and dying. Plato recommended that we practice dying. He must have had a protected life. Many of us began practicing early, when people we needed left or died and our world collapsed. I cannot imagine my own death will seem very important to me now. It is true I have been lucky, with a remarkable family and friends, the most interesting work in the world, and a body that held up for many decades. I have lived much more than I expected, which I believe is what makes death bearable. But I do not mean I take myself as lightly as I would like. Hearing Desmond Tutu speak, I realized the truth of a friend's quotation, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. Tutu said, with Secret Service people standing by, that he must go back to South Africa immediately. His wife had said so. Since coming to America, she told him he had been made a bishop and won the Nobel thing. When she woke in the morning, she felt like she had been sleeping with a pope. 
He seemed to me truly light as he told this serious joke upon himself in the shadows of the watchful men assigned to protect him from assassination. I would like to be like that, close to the facts, not weighed down with self-importance. I can read a paragraph of Conrad and see how close to human truth some stay. I wish I could carry my ideal simply as an ideal like Tutu. And let my striving be just that, a striving. Now, poor Tutu may have to reach a still more perilous striving to place himself between the blacks and whites, the first understandably enraged and the second so guilty, in order to show that respect must go everywhere. Nietzsche had the extraordinary notion that we should ask of our lives if we would live them over and over again with nothing changed. He, like most of us, I expect, was repulsed by the idea. But the question became a test. If we have used our experience to fashion a viable existence, we owe that result in part to the experience and should be grateful not only for the viable existence, but also for the past, however painful, from which it came. Many would exclaim, there must be an easier way. But there may not be. I wonder if this is the reason the greatest stories are told and read over and over again, because the result justifies the pain. And why these same stories must be rewritten for every age so we can see that they may be our stories, too. A man appeared to have died during a difficult journey far from home. He was half buried by the roadside, but in fact had not died, recovered, and very slowly made his way back. He was not well received. They had mourned him as dead. Now he had returned, and they had already divided his possessions. To the old, I say, in order to preserve a viable existence, keep your wills a little secret, as what attractiveness your character had lessens, and you become more and more a, a burden. Keep the power you have right to the end, so they will protect you in the belly of the whale. If anyone asks whether God exists, Perhaps you should answer as Gandhi did when he was asked what he thought of Western civilization. That would be a good idea. Humans are a colossal, discordant family, much in need of a good mother and father. Meanwhile, we may not be wise to assume that there is someone beside ourselves who will save us. For many of those I have admired most, religion is the history of human wisdom and folly to be rethought by every age and people so they can take possession of themselves, free and compliant. Can we, as well, travel that human ground in such a way we open ourselves to what it teaches and use its collisions, not as a spur to revenge, but to fashion a life that can be lived and a death that can be died with only those regrets that signal hopes we need never have had. We will have caught a glimpse of each other and ourselves, a sigh, a smile that link us all together on the human ground, the dead to the living, and the living to the unborn. <laughs>